Let's talk about rectal myths. We've got a bunch of papers here uh, to look at, and they talk about a variety of things. The first topic that, that is one which is, you know, is there any sex and, you know, sort of gender preference of the examination? We know, and it's kind of an interesting topic if you ask us about pelvic exams and rectal exams and, uh, and, and scrotal exams, there's kind of an interesting literature and also a failure to react to that literature. So let me just kind of summarize what it is and we'll talk about the first paper. The literature says pretty clearly that in general, women who are gonna have a pelvic exam care about the gender of the examiner. They would prefer it to be done by a woman if that's possible. We know in an emergency room that's not always possible, particularly if you're single covered. But, and, and sometimes, by the way, frankly, if I'm working with a woman and say, hey, there's a vag bleeder, will you see her? That doesn't go over big with the women either. They're like, you know, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to be the vag bleed specialist when I'm working with you. Um, so in general, we don't necessarily respond to that. But it, there's some other things it says. So women like to have um, women be examined by women when it's possible, when there's a female doctor. And they like a chaperone. And they like the chaperone generally to be a medical professional. So one of the things that happens a lot in the ER is, you know, Susie's there with her friend, and Susie says, can I come in for the exam? It's pretty private, and although Susie thinks she's the best friend, um, it may not be right. And the, the literature suggests that women want a healthcare professional who can tell them what to expect. The doctor's going to do this next or that next. You might feel a little pressure here, that kind of thing. That's what it says. Interestingly, um, ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gyne, and the American Academy of Family Practice have never come out with chaperoning guidelines, in spite of the data which says this. And it's pretty interesting, I think it's pretty obvious why they haven't. A lot of those people are in solo practices. They couldn't mandate chaperones in some of these office settings because there would be no one to do it. Having noted that, I would say for those of us in the emergency department setting, it's really hard to build a compelling argument for not having a chaperone. I think all of these exams should be chaperoned. I know doctors, I know of one case um, where the doctor, when he was doing the bimanual, routinely closed his eyes as a way of picturing what he was feeling because it was, you know, it's a tactile, not a visual exam, and was accused of having pleasure. The woman uh, wrote a note to the medical board indicating that he seemed to be enjoying it and pleasuring himself with the exam because his eyes were closed with glee. And you just don't want any of those claims to be made. And so regardless of your gender, I recommend in the emergency department you be shapped. Some people are paranoid about, enough about it that they name the chaperone in their dictation report. What does abstract one say? It says that with rectal exams, that the pain is irrelevant based on the examiner. You should do it slowly and gently, and, uh, but it doesn't seem to, examiner experience or prostate exam doesn't increase it. And it says some other things which are kind of interesting. If you go to the other side of the coin for men, and you're going to examine, if you will, the package. Um, men aren't really interested in a critical appraisal of their package. They don't, they're not happy about having to have it done. If it does have to be done, the literature is pretty clear. They don't want a chaperone in there. They want a few eyes. It's, they don't want the, the critical experience to be a team sport. They don't particularly care uh, about the gender of the examiner. They just want it to be over, is what the literature says. Um, okay, you got to look at this. Fine. Let's get it over with. And that's kind of what it says about men. Um, uh, embarrassment was greater for younger men in this study that in terms of the rectal exam. You know, uh, if you talked about teen boys, they were pr a little prone to be uh, more uh, embarrassed about it. Is a rectal an extremely painful experience? I don't think it is. Do you remember for a long time people made a big fuss about how you shouldn't do it in the MI patient? That really hasn't been addressed well as to whether or not you need to avoid this, you know, is it going to cause chest pain? There is one medical area where we know you shouldn't do a rectal exam. And that is in the absolute neutropenic, you know, post-chemo patient. You know, seeding them with uh, gram negatives during your rectal exam when they have, you know, when they know all three of their white cells, you know, Manny, Mo, and Jack, um, is not a good idea. If that's all they got left, then you probably shouldn't do a rectal exam. But beyond that, we're gonna look at some other uh, myths in the topic. How many of you have taken an ATLS course? This always causes some pain. So a little less than the normal course here. ATLS would tell you, and the, with some joy by the teachers, usually a surgeon, that fingers and tubes belong in every orifice. And they usually follow that. The lecture usually follows that with, with a statement that goes like this. The only indications for skipping a rectal are you don't have fingers or they don't have an asshole. They love to say that. Um, uh, and so the question is, what is really the yield 
of a rectal exam in a trauma patient. You know, is the rectal exam like a big surprise to you? And so we have a couple of papers that deal with this. Abstract 2 uh, looked at 423 patients. Care was altered in 1% of the patients by a rectal exam. And, and when you look at how care was altered, you've got to read the paper carefully for the definitions. It's kind of suspect, even in the 1%. Um, um, and even there, there were problems. One patient uh, they thought was a malingerer with normal rectal tone. They determined his malingering status by a rectal exam. Okay, I'll give it to you if you swear by it. Um, uh, uh, three had, uh, were blood positive where it suggested a rectosigmoid injury. And I think someone with a lower abdominal gunshot wound, I would certainly recommend doing a rectal exam. Um, but generally, they point out that it's pretty, pretty clear the patients are where this would be of interest to you and that the rest of them, you don't really need to do it. ATLS is still going to paint you as a cavalier doctor if you were to skip the rectal. We'll get to other ways to skip the rectal in a moment. Um, and one other thing that comes up with this, uh, with trauma patients, is you're about to paralyze and intubate them with either succinylcholine or, or for longer paralysis, you might even choose rocuronium um, if there was a reason to go that way. And it is frustrating for a neurosurgeon when you haven't done enough of a neuro exam to know that they, whether or not they have a spinal cord injury and you've now paralyzed them and they can't examine them. So I think that a rectal exam in trauma should precede paralysis and rapid sequence intubation if you're gonna do it. Um, it just is hard for people who are later gonna manage the patient, and particularly if you're gonna use rocuronium, which could be expected to last 45 minutes, you ought to do it. Um, the next couple papers deal with the question of, can you really on a rectal exam find pelvic fractures? Dear God, I hope not. Um, there is a suggestion that you could, and we all know about there are these signs, if you were to look in that, you know, Dorland's Medical Dictionary kind of thing, you know, there's Earl sign and Desto sign. Desto sign's a palpable of a palpation, I think, of a fracture on a rectovaginal exam, or an Earl's is an inguinal hematoma due to an anterior ring pelvic fracture. I might have them backwards. It's not, which sign is which isn't important, but anyway, these are pelvic signs that are discussed. Um, and so abstract three looks at palpating posterior pelvic rim fractures on the rectal exam. This is a paper by McCormick at Denver General talking about sacral, clearly sacral fractures you can get to on a rectal exam, the distal portion of the sacrum, but they're not very important. Um, can you get to SI, you know, sacral iliac fractures? I hope not. And they said that the sensitivity of the rectal exam, here's a sensitivity to hang your hat on, 14%. Not very good. Um, as opposed to the CT scan sensitivity, uh, 98%. So I think that the CT scan is a much better way to find these fractures than the rectal exam. How good is AP compression and, and lateral compression for pelvic fractures? Not very good. It'll only find the most grossly unstable fractures and not very good. Abstract 4 says, what about blunt trauma decision rule? By the way, so penetrating trauma that crosses the lower abdomen, by all means do a rectal exam to look for blood. Blunt trauma, what's the yield? You expect it to be lower quite a bit. This is a, a th uh, four and five are both from Loma Linda. Pretty good science, methodology kind of stuff. Looked at decision rules and said that you need a rectal exam if your age is greater than 65, if there's blood at the meatus, or if you have an abnormal neuro exam, something like priapism. That would, those would be the indications. And that 9% of their um, rectal exams out of 600 something uh, or about 600 blunt trauma patients were abnormal, but a third of those were false positive with decreased tone or a question of a high riding prostate. So of their nine rectal exams that were deemed to be abnormal, three were found out to be falsely positive and six were real and all six of those would have been over the age of 65 blood at the meatus or an abnormal neuro exam. And so they said you could safely defer it if none were present. Now this was kind of a, uh, if you will, this was kind of a derivation set with a weaker validation set. Abstract five, same guy, 5.2% of 1,000 blunt traumas had a spinal cord injury. How sensitive was the rectal exam for that? 50%. That's not useless. Spinal cord injuries, high state games. I'd like to know if they have that. It's not useless, but certainly don't hang your hat on it if it seems normal to you. And then abstract six is by a surgeon. It's by, um, what's the guy's name? Is it Esposito? Is that who it's by? I don't have it here. Yeah, Esposito. Esposito is the guy who wrote the big trauma text 
Many of you have seen that book if you've been at any of the ASAP bookstores and stuff. So this is by uh, Esposito, and, it, and he points out that the ATLS dogma, which is you've always got to do a rectal exam, you know, uh, is not true, and that there's another reason you might skip the rectal exam is that there's no useful information to be obtained there. And he said that that the rectal exam is really unlikely to add information. Um, and he looked at some index injuries that would that where it might be useful. Urethral disruption, there were two in uh, in this series. Spinal cord injury, 17. GI bleeding, 11. And he didn't include pelvic fractures. And that was 6%, or about 30 total patients. The positive predictive value of the digital rectal, 27%. So it, all, throughout this literature, recurrent again is the concept that the exam Sensitivity low, specificity low, overall yield low. Now, if we were going to talk about exam in general in medicine, what would we say about the exam? Low. Where do you make your diagnosis, right? It's mostly in the history. The exam is mostly to confirm what the history is suspected and, and to help you go further. So in any place we wanted to talk about the exam, I mean, truthfully, you could say, in terms of your stethoscope, that the main reason you wear a stethoscope at work is not for all the useful examining you do with it. It's a symbol that you're a doctor. That you wear a stethoscope so they don't ask you to get them a cheeseburger. <laughs> That's why you wear it. Um, you know, there are a few places where your stethoscope is critical. Surgical valvular lesions and cardiac disease, it can be important. But I could, I could, from an auscultatory standpoint, I'd be pretty comfortable if you told me that all I was going to have for my next shift at the county was a roll of toilet paper. That was what I was going to have to listen through. I'd be pretty sure it wouldn't affect my care, quite frankly. So, you know, the fact that the digital rectal exam performs, here's one segment of the exam overall that performs poorly, you know, many segments of the exam would perform poorly and have poor interrater agreement and things like that. One of my favorite papers on the exam, in fact, it's about the stethoscope, was where they took the 10 legendary cardiologists of the, of the United States, the big escultatory geniuses. And they said, we'd like you to listen to these 30 patients. And they had them draped out, so all they could do was see the chest that they were putting the stethoscopes on. And the, thir the 30 patients they were listening to, ooh, we lied to them, sorry, it was 10 patients three times. They all had fixed M-mode echocardiographic auscultatory lesions. And the results of the legendary cardiologists listening to them, not only did they not agree with each other about what they were hearing, but they didn't agree with themselves when they were listening to the same patient with a fixed M-mode lesion. <laughs> Which is why whenever someone comes down to the department, in our department and says, did you hear that paradoxically split S2 or the slight diastolic? You know, I, I always look at them when they say that, when the cardiologists come down, and I look at them, and I like this word because it causes them pause for a second. I look at them, yeah, and what about the diastolic rumble? I like to just inter in interject the possibility of a rumble that causes them, causes them some reason for concern when they see me. So I like to just bring the rumble into the situation just to, you know, don't ever be confused by someone who says they heard all this crap because they didn't. And so it shouldn't be surprising that the rectal exam doesn't perform particularly well either when you want to look shine the bright light of science, if I can use that phrase, on it. It's not surprising that it doesn't do well. How about the rectal exam in Appy? And we have Appy both in peds and adults here to look at. You know, the consequence that you're going to reach up to the iliocolic fracture and tickle an inflamed, uh, an inflamed appendix through the rectum, please, dear God, say it isn't true. Might you find the phlegmon or inflamed intestines nearby and some tenderness? Uh, I hope you're not reaching for it, really. But you might find alternate things. So in kids who are really tender, you know, sometimes you stick a finger up there and there's like rocks up there. And so suddenly the possibility that constipation is a real issue with this child uh, becomes something that you might not have thought of before. Because it's not like the mother gives you a great stool history um, with a lot of these kids. So that might be helpful. Um, and abstract 7 and abstract 16 are similar. 7 for adults, 16 for kids. They do something that shouldn't shouldn't alarm you too much, but they point to a bigger issue with regard to the rectal exam and appendicitis. Both of these papers look at closed claims of missed appendicitis and compare them to cases where appendicitis was diagnosed. And what do you think they found with regard to the rectal? They found that on the missed cases of appendicitis, the rectal wasn't done more than on the cases where it was. 
And so you could, you could look at this. This is clearly an association, right? The, there's no causality established here. But the association of a rectal exam with making the diagnosis is clear in both of those papers. And it really is another issue that comes up. In the ER, we're seen sometimes as triage monkeys, as, as you know, we're, you know, one of the sayings about emergency medicine is, you know, I never met a, di you know, a conclusion I wouldn't jump. Um, you know, that kind of thing. You know, we're, we're seen as that kind of fast decision maker, shooting from the hip kind of type. And so claims that were cavalier or not complete are kind of damaging claims to have made against you if you work in the emergency room. And so the rectal exam is more a marker of completeness and thoroughness than it is an actual diagnostic aid. And that's exactly what you're seeing in these two papers, 7 and 16. The doctor who was thorough and a little worried, whose sniffer was like, uh, I can't really blow this case off, does a rectal exam. The one who's saying, ah, this is nothing, the kid's got nothing, just, you know, I'm not going to do a rectal exam and, and dismisses them. They're the ones who are getting burned in the missed appy cases. By the way, what's the most common diagnosis in missed appy and peds? This one hurts. URI. How does that work? The kid comes in vomiting. He's got boogers. He's got a fever. You know what that is. It's a URI. It's what I got right now. Vomiting, boogers, and a fever. And indeed, that's what the kid had. But the kid may have also been, you know, their... Their pyres patches get inflamed, they, get, they may get mesenteric adenitis, and then there's some pressure on the appendix, and three days later, they got appendicitis, and you get dinged for missing it. So it's a reminder that whenever you see boogers and a fever on a kid, that they get a little push down in their, in their belly to make sure there's no peritoneal signs and no marked tenderness in the right lower quadrant. It's a reminder. Um, in adults, the most common misdiagnosis in, a, in, a, in appendicitis is gastroenteritis oftentimes with no diarrhea. You can't call it gastroenteritis if there's no diarrhea. Eight is a British study, 1,200 papers, uh, patients with right lower quadrant pain. Rectals were done in 85%. This is a great paper. Sometimes people don't like these types of papers, but look at the final diagnosis in this paper. A third were appy, a third were no diagnosis, and a third were another diagnosis. I need to see that. If I don't see a distribution of patients like that, then they're not dealing with ER papers. When you see these papers where 70% of them were appendicitis, that's not the ER. Those are a selected population. And any ER study should have a, between a third and a half of abdominal pain patients having no final diagnosis. That's our world in the emergency department. So that's a good study. And they said that the rectal was not that helpful. They said it's better, you could do it if the age was greater than 50 and prostatitis and other things were rearing their ugly head. Can prostatitis cause a lot of low abdominal pain in a man? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And it can fool you. And they may not say it hurts when they defecate and things like that that are typical for prostatitis. And they may not have GU symptoms. So prostatitis is another important diagnosis. Obviously it's more common in age greater than 50. Another paper from the Brits, Abstract 9, looking at abdominal pain. A third were appy. 78% um, reported the exam was uncomfortable. 18% said it was painful, pointing out that if it's, there's no yield to this, we ought, to, we ought to question our routine usage of it. And this says that there's no support for this as a routine physical exam element. Abstract 10 says the digital rectal exam is nonspecific. It's not like you reach the cecum. A positive digital rectal exam, 46% of the patients had appy, and it was a positive digital rectal exam. If you took all the positives, 53% of them had no appy, usually women with pelvic problems. You're much more likely to reach a pelvic process on a rectal exam since the pelvic organs sit much lower um, and find adnexal tenderness by a, by a rectal exam than you are to find, you know, right lower quadrant tenderness on a rectal exam. And so on women with a positive rectal, it, this paper suggests that you ought to be considering more pelvic pathology than necessarily appendicitis. Abstract 11 uh, looks at some of these things and says the duration of pain uh, might be important and kinds of things like that. And that the white counts, you know, you know with appendicitis, right, there's a lot of things that aren't helpful. This paper just sort of summarizes. The white count's not helpful, the UA is not helpful, the KUB is not helpful, and the rectal in that paper wasn't particularly helpful. Pointing out again, and remember the scoring systems that used to exist for Appy, like in PEDS, there was the Mantrell score. I don't know if you guys remember that. Migration, anorexia, nausea, temp, right lower quadrant pain, emesis, and leukocytosis makes the word Mantrell. And the Mantrell score was a way to miss, stop missing appendicitis in kids if their score was greater than X number. But it never really worked that well. All of these papers remind us that 
appendicitis is protein in its presentation. You could say, where, who's, what's heart appendicitis? Oh, it's heart if they're immunocompromised, heart if they've had previous surgical disease, heart if they're young, heart if they're old. And they're, they build these lists, heart if they're pregnant. They build this list of when appendicitis is hard. But no appendicitis is harder than early appendicitis. Tincture of time. By the way, what, and although the papers aren't collected here for you, they are in the Emma database. What does the literature say if you're going to have someone have a repeat abdominal check when you think there's not enough there to scan them, uh, but your you know, appy could be in the differential? How long should it elapse before their repeat exam? So people looked at this, and there are actually a bunch of closed claims cases that say that 24 hours is too long. So if you're going to have someone back for an abdomen recheck, it ought to be in 12 hours which in my hospital means they go out and register when I'm done with them. <laughs> sure, we'd like to recheck you in 12 hours. Um, we're discharging you now. If you could just get in line again to register, we'll be with you um, when that exam should come up. Does the appendix move in pregnancy? You know, you got this gravid uterus that's expanding, filling up the, the true pelvis, and then expanding into the lower abdomen, rising up to the umbilicus at 20 weeks. Does it push the appendix over? You know, that's the normal thing that's said, that the appendix might be more retrocecal or more abnormally located, right? That's a common reason for why appendicitis is missed in pregnancy. That's what that's offered up. Is it true? No, it's a myth. Um, we have two papers here, 12 and 18. Um, that looked at this 18s in an Iranian paper where they, these women were going to get C-sections. They said, shit, we're going to open them up and look at them anyway, either through a fan and steel incision or a classic cesarean incision. Why don't we just look where the appendix is when we're in there and just measure it? And so they measured the location of the appendix and they said, hey, it's right where it's supposed to be in all these women. There may be some delay in diagnosis because peritoneal stretching means that the visceral pain sensation is less obvious or delayed. So women who are pregnant might, by definition, be a little bit delayed in their presentation because of that. But that myth hasn't had the bright light of science on it. But in terms of the abnormal location of the appendix in pregnancy, both 12 and 18 say that's not really the case and suggest that there must be other reasons for why we're missing it. I think the reason we miss appendicitis or, or that there's more misses, by the way, what's the overall rate of appendicitis in pregnancy? Higher, lower, or unchanged? That's a standard board question, unchanged. But the perf rate is higher, and the misdiagnosis rate is higher. I think it's because we're entertaining other diagnoses. We're calling it round ligament syndrome. We're calling it, you know, those types of things. It's not uncommon to see a woman who's afebrile with pelvic pain as she enters into her third trimester, as the weight starts getting big and things starts moving around. And so we blow it off more. We just have another diagnosis to lean on. And so that's why I think it gets missed more, is there are other things to entertain. So pediatric happy, we got a bunch of papers on that, 13, 14, 15, and 16. I already talked about 16, which is the, the one that says that rectals not doing one is associated with missing an appy. Um, 13 is a paper that says if there's a diagnosis um, of, and other findings that are suggestive of a, where you don't need the rectal, then you can skip it. But if you're concerned, if you're entertaining things like constipation and stuff in a kid, then go ahead and do it. 14 from Indiana, 1,100 kids, uh, says that you know, the appy really wasn't positive that often and says that the appy is a test, not part of the routine exam, it's a test. And that the appy as a test should be done on a selective basis. Tests have indications. And my favorite phrase of all in this, I've used this one, I, I can use it because I'm an attending and I have surgical residents coming down. The surgical attendings come down too, but I can use it. But 15, which is a British study that says, consider the rectal exam to be an, an investigation, not a routine part of the exam, and that if it is in fact that, that it should be done by the most skilled person. <laughs> rectal deferred for surgical expertise. <laughs> Try that one on for some. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there and ruin the rectal exam for you. You know, those surgically skilled fingers of yours really should begin with such a difficult to interpret test as this. Perhaps the reason the sensitivity of the rectal exam is so low is it hasn't been deferred to surgical expertise nearly enough. Try that one on for size. I think really that this is, this, the, uh, while we're talking about the low yield of rectal overall, if you were to ask me what my take on this is, exam has a low yield in general. Two. 
in an emergency room, I don't want to be accused of being a triage monkey. I say to our residents over and over and over again in a hundred different ways, in a hundred different situations, please don't force me to choose between compulsive and clever. I'd love you to be clever, but if I have to choose one or the other, compulsive wins every time. And so a rectal exam is part of a careful compulsive exam. It should be done gently. I don't think it hurts that much. Um, I don't want to be called or accused of cavalier. I'm proud of the fact that I can see people fast, but I don't want, speed is the enemy of thorough. And, and, and claims that these damage you in your hospital. If there are assertions made that, you know, you can't really trust that guy down on the first floor, you better verify it. And internist, how many of you have been asked by an internist, do you do the rectal? How many of you have been asked by that in the year? And not as many hands as I would predict. A lot of times when you ask that question, a lot go up. It's just a little check. They're just trying to say, please be thorough. That's really what, when, that, when you get asked that question, what they're saying is, please be thorough. Don't leave stones unturned for me that you could have got to easily. And so that's, that's my take on it is we know the yield is low. It's probably more a marker of thoroughness and compulsiveness than it is of any, any genius diagnostic tool. And Abstract 17 by Scott Brewster, one of Jerry's residents, summarized the topic nicely. It said, you should use the rectal if a diagnosis that m you might make on the rectal exam is there or you're suspecting it, something like prostatitis, constipation, fistula and anal, rectal abscess, GI bleeding from any source, then the rectal exam is an important part of the exam and you should do it. It's part of confirming what your historical suspicions were. That the contributory effect of rectal exam, even if you took all the diagnoses I just listed, is around 1%. But most physical exam contributes at around that rate. It doesn't mean the rectal is useless, it just means it's got a low contributory rate, as does most physical exam. You should do it gently, you should do it once by the person making the decision. And I like that, that summary by Scott Brewster, it's clean, it's succinct, it talks about what the issue is. You know, the rectal exam, is it going to help you in appy? Probably a myth. Is it going to help you in a surgical case that's not penetrating trauma? Probably a myth. Should you do it before you paralyze people? Yeah, I think so. Should you do it in people with penetrating trauma where they could have rectosigmoid bleeding or vag bleeding? Yes. <laughs> Are you interested in pelvic fractures? Yeah, I am, because if they got a tear there, it's an open pelvic fracture. I want to get antibiotics up early. Open pelvic fractures that open into the, into the vag vault or into the rectum have a terrible prognosis, and I don't want someone, that's off the top, and I don't want someone linking their terrible outcomes to the fact that someone didn't consider giving them antibiotics because it wasn't found. So that's sort of my take on the rectal. Certainly not to help you. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. Um, should be done carefully, gently, with regard to what your differential is. That's it.